Thank you very much. Uh, before we do anything, I think we should give Robin, the, the people affiliated with uh, and, and the supporters of the Beverly Library here, for putting on presentations like this. They're very informative and, and uh, I, I'm, I'm tickled pink to be here. I, I really enjoy this. Uh, all of my hobbies I have a tendency to fall in love with. And uh, this is my latest. Uh, I happen to get into birds. I don't claim to be an expert. I've only been doing this two years. And I, um, I may make a mistake. I don't know how many of you are professional bird watchers, but if I make a mistake, come see me at the end and then tell me that uh, I called this bird wrong or that. <laughs> but uh, I, I got into birding through uh, my mushrooming. While I was out mushrooming, naturally I had my camera with me like I always do. And uh, I'm picking mushrooms, taking pictures of mushrooms, but I'm, you know, look at this beautiful bird in the tree. So I take a picture and then I got the idea, you know, I'm going to start filming birds and maybe put together a show on, uh, on birds. So I started collecting pictures and now I have thousands of them. And uh, I have, it was very difficult putting this together uh, for you people today because I have so many pictures that I want to show you on top of what I have here, but I just can't do it because uh, it would just, we'd be here till the cows came home. So anyhow, uh, uh, I do a lot of photography uh, on birds very local areas here and my, my whole drift of this show is to show you what birds look like up close and personal. Usually when you're driving along, say for instance a shoe pond where I do an awful lot of shooting and the birds there are totally incredible if you take the time to look. They, they're there uh, but you're seeing them from a distance, so you really don't pay attention to them. But if you pay a little more attention, especially with the ice going out now, and uh, the, the, uh, the diving ducks are going to appear, and uh, a lot of other wonderful, wonderful, colorful birds will be at the shoe pond very soon. So keep an eye as you're going by there, or stop, or take a walk around the pond. There's a nice walking area all the way around that people use today. And uh, I've been visiting the shoe pond ever since I was a kid. I used to fish there as a kid. Uh, I'd take the fish home. I would eat the fish. People say, oh, you ate fish out of the shoe pond? Uh, when you didn't have anything else to eat, it was delicious. <laughs> so, uh, but take a look the next time you're going around and uh, put a pair of binoculars in your car and then take a closer look. As you're walking along McKay Street, you can look down, there's a sloping thing, a uh, uh, grassy area, a lot of poison ivy, so you don't want to walk down there. And you'll see these diving ducks down there. Uh, and I'll, I'll be coming home or going by, and I'll see the ducks, so I'll pull up a ways, park my car, and get out of the car. And then I go walking, I park the car here, and the ducks are over here. Now I know these diving ducks, they stay down for about 30 seconds. You can, they send off a bubble trail so you can see where they're going. So I wait for the duck to dive and then I start walking along like this here on the sidewalk, you know, so he doesn't see me. Because when they see you, they're always, they take off. They, they got very good eyes. So I'm walking along and, uh, People are going by and seeing me walking like this, you know, and I'm going, oh my God. So uh, the duck goes down and I, I can walk for about 30 seconds. And then I know I can see the bubble starting to get up in one spot. I know the duck is coming up. So I freeze. Now I'm in the street like this and people are going by seeing this mannequin standing there on the side of the street. And uh, they're calling my wife and saying, I saw Doogie on the, 
on the street the other day and he was frozen and it wasn't cold out, you know. <laughs> so it, it, uh, it's very tricky. You have to use all kinds of things. I'm into camouflage now. I'm buying a kayak so I can get closer to the birds. Uh, it, it, it's really getting uh, bizarre. But it's, it's a tremendous amount of fun and with the camouflage uh, and a little bit of stealth, uh, I, can, I can get closer to the birds. I've got to tell you this one quick story, if I can make it as quick as possible. Uh, I have a lot of things that happen to me all the time. I don't know why, but they always, they, I just get into things that I don't really mean to get into. And while I was out shooting one day, I was shooting some ducks down behind Starbuck on Elliott Street. And I looked over and I saw a goose on his back. And I said, what is a goose doing on his back? So I, I went over to the bird, and he's laying there, and he just kind of, and I said, oh, the poor thing, you know. So I picked him up, and they're, they're pretty hefty bird. So I got this goose under my arm, and I, I what am I going to do with this goose? And I walked back to my car, and as I'm walking back, a couple of waitresses came out from Starbucks and said, uh, we see that goose out there, you know, for a couple of days, and we didn't know what to do. And I said, oh, she said, thank you very much for picking him up. See if you can help him. I said, okay. So I got the goose, and she says, can I get you some bread? And I said, yeah, give me some water, too. The goose might like some water. So they brought me out a cup of water and a, a bagel. <laughs> I, I uh, brought the goose over to the car and I, I, I fed the goose and he ate, oh man, he was just so happy to have something to eat and he chucked him down the water. He's delighted, right? So now I say, okay, I've got this goose, what am I going to do with him? So I put the goose under my arm and I get in my car and I'm driving up McKay Street and I've got a goose under my arm while I'm driving. And a lot of times you'll see a person driving along with their dog in the wind, you know, and the dog has got his head out the window and he's smiling, you know, he's really liking it. Well, the goose had his head out the window like this here. And people are going by and going off the side of the road, you know, with this goose like this here, you know. And then I'm thinking as I'm going along, what am I going to do with this goose when I get at home? And I got an idea. I always have great ideas. I called a friend of mine that has three dogs, and I figured she has a crate that I could put this goose in. So, called her up, got on the phone, I, and I pulled over. I didn't make a phone call, you know, with a goose under my arm and the phone in my hand, you know, like this here. If I ever got stopped, they'd throw away the key. So. I, uh, I called my friend up and I said, Lynn, I, I, have you got a dog cage? And she said, yes. I said, could you tell, uh, bring it out? And she says, Doogie, it's like 6.30 in the morning. I says, I don't care. She says, I'm in my pajamas. I said, I don't care. I need the cage now. So she, I pulled up at a house and she came out. She had the cage and I put the cage down put the goose in the cage, put it in the back of my car, and I said, okay, I, don't, I only have a short distance to go now to my home. So I'm driving home, and then all of a sudden, I got this awful, awful smell. <laughs> and I pulled over, and I went around to the back of the car, and I opened the door, and it was like, oh my God. I had a goose on the loose, and it wasn't from the cage. He was loose. He, I don't like to say the word, so I'll just use, he had the big D, you know. Uh, Montezuma's Revenge. We've all been there when we go on vacations and so forth. And it's pretty, pretty sad case right now. So I drove home, get in the driveway, uh, put the cage down, reached in, I put the cage down, got the hose out, put it on shower, and I'm showering this goose to get him cleaned up. Uh, once I got him fairly well cleaned so I could grab him, I took him out, rinsed him off some more, 
and now I've got a soaking wet goose in a cage full of poo, and uh, what am I going to do with this goose now? So I got an idea, I'll put him in my shed. So I took the goose and put him in my shed, closed the door, and went back and cleaned the, the cage, got it all nice and bright and shiny for him again, went to get the goose, and all of a sudden, mistake number two, uh, I now have to hose down my shed because he's taking care of that too. So now I take the goose back out, put him in, cut the goose in the cage, and everything is fine except that I have no clue what I'm going to do with this goose. It just so happens that I had the big D at the same time the goose did. So in all my wisdom, I thought, aha, I've got an idea. I had the goose for two days, fed him, washed him every day, two or three times a day. And finally I said, hmm, I've been taking these pills for my big D, so I have an idea. I'll give the goose some of my big D pills, and I think I can fix his problem, and we're all set. I'll take him down the pond, let him go, and he can swim around the pond. If he does have an accident, he has the whole shoe pond as his private bidet, you know? So I take the goose, I give him, I read the label, take two the first day, okay. So I took two out, gave the goose two pills, took him to the shoe pond, let him go, and um, all of this time, from the time I picked the goose up, you know, photography had stopped, so usually I, I take pictures of everything. Didn't have time to do that. I took him, I let him go, and I went back the next day, and the goose was quite content. He was swimming around and so forth. And people asked me, they said, how did you know it was the same goose? Aren't there were other goose, geese there? And I said, yes. And how did you know it was the same goose? And I said, because he was the largest goose on the pond. He was so bound up now that he just kind of blew up a little bit. So I said, listen, pal, you're on your own, you know? That's it, that's it. So that's my goose story. And uh, we'll get on with the show here. My dog is with me every morning when I go out to take these pictures of the birds. And, now she's come fascinated with birds and she goes bird watching on her own in the yard, you know. Now this is the typical scene that you'll see. Some of these pictures are at the shoe pond and or wherever. But you'll see a bird from afar and uh, like this one here, the great white egret. Uh, an an another one here, this is on the other side of the shoe pond looking from McKay Street. You got grackles and up here you have a red-tailed hawk, but you're really not seeing the birds the way they should be seen. Again, this is a small pond, you drive by and you look out and you really don't see much, but if you take the time to look, there are two beautiful ducks right here. One is, they're both wood ducks, and the wood duck is one of the most beautiful birds in the world. I saw my first last year for the first time, and I tell you, I was ready to just start swimming out there to get pictures. So just to get an idea, you, looking from the street, this is what you see, and if I didn't tell you, you probably wouldn't have seen the wood ducks. But there they are there, and not only are the wood ducks there, but there are turtles, 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 turtles everywhere, you know? And there they are. That is a beautiful bird. Anytime you see a, a, bird, a, a duck in a tree, if you're driving along and you happen to look up and you see a duck in a tree, it's a wood duck, okay? They live in trees in hollowed out areas and so forth. Regular ducks don't do this. They, they're on the ground and they nest on the ground. A lot of times you'll be out and you'll hear this beautiful call of the Baltimore Oriole. It's, again, if I had the sound. I'm sorry? Did you? Red Sox. Oh, yes, that's right. That's very good. That's very good. But anyhow, you'll hear an Oriole and you're looking around and, oh my God, where is he? Where is he? You know? And I, this particular day, I, I saw this tree and 
and I'm looking, I could hear this guy singing like crazy, and I finally zoomed into the top of the tree, and there he was, you know, this Baltimore Oriole. A short time later, you know, uh, I, I see this nest in another tree, and I also, I, I remember as a kid seeing these nests, and I often wondered, I said, what do they make those nests out of? It's not like a robin's nest or whatever. I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. And another day, I heard the Oriole, and uh, he was across the street, and about as high as the ceiling here. A lot of leaves in my way, so the shots were kind of difficult and blurry. Uh, but I noticed the female, and she is uh, stripping the bark off of this limb right here. You can see it hanging here. And the male is standing by, and she's got this bark in her bill, and she would go to the nest and come back, and that's how they build these nests. It's from bark of the tree that she strips off, and she does all the work. Of course, yes. And this is the male. He's getting all excited about this. You know, he knows he's going to have a nest here, and he's telling her, you know, come on, hurry up with the nest. Tonight's the night, you know. Uh, let's get this thing going, you know. Now we have the uh, house finch, uh, small birds, big birds, uh, they're everywhere. And you ever see these little leaves that drop off the maple tree? They come down like a propeller. Uh, these guys love those. They, they, they peck them apart, and there's a seed inside that they eat. And I kind of sat and watched these guys uh, doing their thing one day. This is the red-bellied uh, woodpecker. I, I don't know why they call it a red-bellied woodpecker. He has a white belly and a red head. Uh, you know, but uh, very attractive bird, fun to watch. Very aggressive bird. Don't come near the bird fight feeder while I'm feeding. And this poor dove over here, he's, he's terrified. And the dove is a, uh, if you take a close look at it, is a very pretty bird also. He uh, has that nice cooing in the morning and it's very relaxing, almost like a loon. Again, it's a pretty bird if you get up close. You see it from a distance, it looks like a pigeon. But if you get up close, they have beautiful markings. Morning dove. Morning dove, yeah. Early in the spring, they started about two, three weeks ago. Black, uh, red-winged blackbirds, you started hearing them. It's the first bird you'll hear in the spring. Uh, and they start their calling uh, on the wing. And they'll just sit around and they fluff up and they start singing like crazy, looking for a mate. This guy looks like he's singing Christmas carols. <laughs> now, this bird is a snowy egret. Very funny bird to watch. But this bird here I see every year. He appears at the end of uh, McKay Street in Elliott, right where the Bass River is. And he hangs out there. And this is at where this picture was taken. And if you look at his feet, there's a toe missing. I call him Three-Fingered Willie. <laughs> okay, and he's got a little fish in his mouth and he's quite happy. Now, this is a, a, an experiment that I made, and on all my bird estates, uh, my signature is the brass ring that goes around the front, because how many times have you seen a birdhouse and it's all chewed apart by either birds or squirrels and so forth trying to get in and get the eggs? So what I do is I always put a brass ring around my holes, and that way they're, they're not, uh, you're not going to get... Uh, taken by a squirrel or other birds. And also, when I make the brass rings, I find these at yard sales and so forth. When I make the brass rings, I make them small enough so that a sparrow can't get in. 
Sparrows can be a very big pain in the neck. Uh, they'll go into a nest, uh, kill, uh, either drive the, uh, the bird that's in there out and, and kill the uh, babies and build a nest right on top of the dead babies and have their own. Uh, so I made the rings small enough so that they can't get in, but chickadees and um, wrens and so forth can, and you're not bothered by sparrows. They'll come along. He's trying to figure out how to get in, and he can't. He's totally puzzled. But look, at him, look at him here. You know, who the hell built this thing? Anyhow, I can't get in here, you know. But uh, there, there's the reason for the brass rings. Now, here's a common bird that you see every day, the grackles, you know. Uh, they're just, they remind me of the Three Stooges. It's, it's, it's kind of an ugly bird, but if you watch them, I, I watched them outside the house one day taking a bath, and, and they're, they're just like watching the Three Stooges. See? You know, look at these two here, you know, and, hey, Charlie, how's it going? Oh, not bad, yeah, fun day, yeah, right. And the house wren, one of my favorite little uh, songbirds, and they also keep these green worms out of my garden. And I welcome as many of them as I can get in my yard. I have bird houses all through my yard, and uh, they do a very good job of helping me with uh, in insects. Uh, cute little thing, uh, here's one of them with another one of my bird estates, and he checked it out. Uh, liked what he saw and he started building his nest. And if you ever find a nest inside your birdhouse and it's built of twigs like this here with nothing else but small twigs, you know it's a house wren. That's the way they uh, build their nest. Again, you can see the ring on the outside of the house, uh, old barn board and, and so forth. I try to make my houses look like they, they're 75 years old or whatever. Uh, another small bird, which is a, a fun little uh, thing, the chickadee. Chickadees are very friendly. Uh, they'll come down, you can put seed in your head and they'll sit on your head or they'll pick it out of your hand. Another one of my favorites is the hummingbird. Beautiful little thing. Uh, I, I could sit and watch these things all day long. Look at the size of the nest. I love it. I mean, the eggs have to be the size of a pea, if that. And a little yellow wobbler. Catch these guys in the woods. Uh, he's doing his thing, you know, doing his song and dance, trying to get that female over there. The goldfinch. Wonderful birds to have around, very easy to get uh, with uh, thistle seed. Uh, but you got to remember, if you buy thistle seed for these birds, or, or the smaller birds, get the treated thistle seed, otherwise you're going to wind up with thistle all over your yard, which you don't need. They treat it so that it won't spring up again it, once the birds drop some on the ground. They're very much fun to watch. This is a, uh, a female here. You can tell the difference, right? And uh, they'll come in 10, 20 at a time sometimes. A couple of males uh, squabbling. And a chickadee coming in for a landing to get his share. And this is a female. This was a... a a flock, and I mean a flock, there were thousands of swallows on their way to Capistrano, I believe. <laughs> and uh, they came over this, these trees, and then all of a sudden they swooped in, and I was in, we were in my Zodiac, which is a, if you all know, it's a rubber boat, and uh, we, I can get in areas like this here, uh, nice and tight, and they just swooped by us, and we had birds going by us at, at the height of the boat, you know. It was amazing, absolutely amazing. And this is the killdeer, a great funny little bird to watch. Uh, you'll see these on farmlands and gardens and, and, and so forth. Uh, it looks like a bird that you see along the seashore, but I, I've seen most of them on farms. 
getting ready to take off. And here's the male cooing the female. Hey, sweetheart, how you doing today? Anything new? <laughs> Naturally, the swan, I caught these two on the shoe pond. They were out walking on the ice, which is very rare. I remember when swans didn't hang around for the winter. And I saw these two on the, uh, walking on the pond, so I grabbed a, a, a shot. Uh, here they are with their, their babies. Uh, oh, quite a brood, quite a brood. Now, these are the younger swans, and it looks like they've, they're trying to take off, but they're not. The parents will bring them out on the pond, and then all of a sudden the parent will come up, and he'll start flapping and flapping like this here, and splashing in the water, and then all of a sudden, the, uh, I forget what they call a young swan. Cygnet. Cygnet. The cygnets start doing the same thing. And what the swan is doing, he's teaching them how to look more powerful and frighten off their enemies, okay? And that's what these guys are doing here. They're, they're just going around, they're splashing and having a hell of a time for themselves. Now, if you go to the shoe pond, if you're familiar with the shoe pond, there are two schools, McNown School and the McKay School. McNown School is right behind here on Ball Street, and McKay School is over here, okay? This area was all trees like this. It was solid. And I used to like to look across from here to the other side of the, of the pond, uh, because there's a lot of action over there. You can't get in there, but there's birds there all the time. So I went home and got a saw, and I made this little circle here. <laughs> so if you're ever looking for a nice place to go and, and view the birds, go there. It's just, there's a walkway that goes around the pond. There's a little footbridge that's right over here. And as you walk in, you can stand right here, and look across, take some binoculars again, like I say, and there is all kinds of action going down on this end of the pond. And this is a turkey vulture, and you see them hovering around 128, very large bird, and they do a lot of good. They, they pick up a lot of roadkill, and I, I happened to spot these one day in the Zodiac and passed them by, and they didn't take off. I get pretty close to them. Not a very pretty bird. And again, a good sized bird when they're in full flight. This is the uh, glossy abyss. Uh, I didn't see one of these. I saw one of these for the first time two years ago. And it's a bird you don't see that often, uh, but they're in swampy areas. And they'll puck around in the mud and uh, peck around, peck around, and stick their <laughs> bills in, in the mud and, and, and get their food. And I looked over and, oh, geez, I looked at it and said, what is this, a red-winged blackbird with a uh, glossy abyss. It was kind of a cute picture. And I, I thought it was very cool. I said, wow, I got a picture that nobody else has. <laughs> Here we have a great, uh, greater yellow legs. You see these around the same farm areas and, and small ponds and so forth. Cute bird. Beautiful bird in flight. And my kingfisher, I can watch these guys all day long going in and out, and then they'll, they play tag with each other in the air. It's like a, a watching a, a, the old uh, uh, fighter planes in World War I. It's really cool. And here's the black crowned night heron. Again, this is on the other side of the shoe pond near McKay School, and uh, there were four of them sitting in the tree here. Again, here's a, here's a great blue heron right in front of me. Got himself a horn pout there. And just a beautiful, beautiful bird. Uh, in, in flight, they're just, oh, wonderful. And this is, a, uh, this is either a young or a female, I'm not sure. Somebody else might know that, I don't. But a lot of times when they're resting, they always get that one paw in the air, I mean that one leg in the air. Beautiful bird in flight. I took the picture. Now, this thing looks like a prehistoric bird. It's not. It's a great blue heron. And uh, it, it, it was the largest blue heron I ever saw. He had a wingspan that was totally incredible. 
in the spring, put about, about another month from now it's off. You get down the dock, in between the docks, it's loaded, loaded with little heron. And these guys come down by the droves and you can just get a chair and sit and watch them. It's wonderful. It's a, it's a show in itself. Try it out sometime. And, and uh, I'm sorry, wait a minute. Uh, you know, they come in and they land and then they'll just sit there like that there. And the heron are in here swimming around by the thousands. And then plunk, you dive in and bingo, he comes up and he's got himself a heron. They were a very pushy bird too. They're like that red-headed woodpecker, you know what I'm saying? I need my space type of bird. Now check this out. Here he is here, he's on there with a, with a couple of uh, um, cormorants, thank you. And uh, he's right here and the, and the ducks are loaded. And then he decides, hey, 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 this is my log, you're going to have to get off. And okay, everybody off, he's walking down one at a time, he's kicking them off, you know. Get off the log, get off the log, this is my log, come on, let's go, let's go, everybody off the log, and here it is, he's got the whole log to himself. Now, real pushy bird. Even a mallard duck, how often do you see them, but how often do you take a real good look at a mallard duck? I caught this duck, I was in the cemetery and there was a puddle in the driveway, and he was just sitting there, and I said, wow, look at this thing, look at the colors, you know? Wonderful. And here they are feeding. Now it's pretty interesting. I watched these guys do this for a amount of time. Uh, one of them is always on the surface anyhow, and the others will go down. And then he'll go down with the others and one of the females will watch. And again, this is Quincy Park. And every, not every morning, but quite a few mornings, every day is a different picture. I, I envy the people that live across the street because the, the, the sights are just absolutely gorgeous. And my dog liked it so much and I got my dog again looking at the sun, sunrises. Now this bird I spotted down the vineyard one time and they don't come up this way. And I was on one of the islands off of Endicott College and I looked over and uh, bingo, here is this uh, American oyster catcher. And I've never seen them this far north and I thought it was great. I, I called the Audubon Society and everybody's getting all excited about this. Uh, and it, there were four of them. I, I didn't just, just get one, I got four. And very interesting bird to watch and very interesting to know that these guys, you ever try opening an oyster shell? Not an easy thing to do. These guys can open an oyster shell. How they do it, I don't know. They, but they use that long bill somehow and they can pop them open and eat the oysters. It's, it's incredible. Blue jays, just a common blue jay. What a beautiful bird. And the closer you get, the more beautiful you can see the details and the feathers and so forth. And again, uh, uh, a blue jay in flight. Uh, and if I saw him from a distance, I'd look up and some, somebody say, what kind of a bird is that? That's a blue jay. And how do you know? I can tell by the way the bird is flying. You know, it's something you get used to. One of my favorite, all, all of them are my favorites, but blue, the cardinal, how, come I, I, how can it not be a favorite? Female cardinal. Now this is a feeder that I have, and if, if you people are interested in doing this, it's a fairly easy thing to do. This is a two-way mirror, so that these birds come to my house, and my feeder is right here, and this is the window that you're looking at here, and I am this close to the bird. They can't see me, so I can watch these birds pull a seed apart with their tongue and beak and, and strip it and then swallow the seed and the antic that they have. This is a female here. She'll eat a seed, uh, clean it and eat it, and then she comes over and she pecks at the bird that's in the mirror on the other side, thinking it's another bird. And then she'll go back and eat a seed and then she'll look and she'll come back and she'll peck. She does this, you know, forever. 
until she's full and then she takes off. And this is from the outside. Very easy to build a box like this. And these are expensive, by the way. I got this at a yard sale. It was a $75 bird feeder. Uh, I, I got it very cheap. Uh, I, I don't know how much I paid for it, but it was, it was super cheap. I, as soon as I saw it, I dove on it. And it had sliding doors in it with these windows, but after a time, they get clouded up. So I went to a pet store, and I asked if they had something I could put in my windows to, to keep this feeder going. I'm going to pull the sliding doors out. And they gave me a, a, a sheet of foil like this here. And what you can do, you can put this foil on your window with these little stickers on either corner. And now you've got a beautiful view of the birds that are going to come to whatever feeder you put out there. And they can't see you. And it's $16. It's very cheap to, for a wonderful show. Again, a, uh, the male in flight. And you have the reds in the, in the females and, and, and so forth, but this next, if I think it's the next picture, if I got it right, I've never seen this before, and I, I'm curious if any of you have ever seen it before. This was the most beautiful cardinal I've ever seen. Amazing. It's, I, don't, I don't know if it was uh, like an albino type of cardinal or what, but this was right outside my window. Right outside my window. It, you know? And uh, I got three shots of him before he took off. Now, the, the, the female doesn't, uh, doesn't have the colored bill like this. It's more of a darker color. So I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe it's a male going through some process, but I can't, has anyone ever seen this? Anyone? No? Wonderful. I feel good about this. This is a, pardon? I went out all day one day to get this bird. I hunted and I hunted and, I, and they're very hard to get near. Very spooky bird, the flicker, and he's just beautiful. And I came home and he's sitting in my backyard. <laughs> Here they are in my patio, picking out insects between the bricks. All day long I spent trying to get the guy and I come home and he's sitting in my backyard. Again, when you look out uh, and you're driving along or you're just looking out uh, in, into an area like this, if you don't look close, you're not going to see it. But there's a green heron right here, okay? And in order to get close, you need the camo. And that's the green heron right there. They're a fun bird to watch also when they're picking out these fish in those ponds and so forth. A crow, I didn't know this until I did a little reading on it, but it's one of the smartest animals in the world. They've got the intelligence of a chimpanzee. And if you look up on uh, uh, Google, how smart is a crow, they'll show you things that these crows can do that is totally unbelievable. I had a friend of mine who adopted a crow that was wounded or something, and he brought it back. And he kept it for a number of years, a couple of years. And uh, the crow's name was Edgar Allan Crow. <laughs> and very, very intelligent bird, very intelligent. This bird, his wife was telling me, this bird would, would be at home and he'd just be resting and her husband would be coming through the Railside Bridge, which is a distance from their house, by boat, and the bird would just start going nuts. That bird knew this, this guy is about four blocks away when he was coming home, every time. Even when he was driving a car three blocks away, the bird would come to life and pop up, and she'd say, oh, Fuzzy's right around the corner, you know? It, it, was, it was remarkable. And he finally, one day, took him out on the porch and said, Edgar, time to go. And he took off. He'd come back a few times, and then he'd 
joined his flock and he was gone. But it's really amazing. Look at it, look that up. How smart is a crow? You'll be amazed at the, at the pictures it shows you. And another, another beautiful bird, the cedar waxwing. I was at the shoe pond again, going, going by, and I saw all these birds high in these big uh, oak trees just before the dam. And they're swinging out of the trees and coming out, and then they'd stop like a, like a hummingbird. And they were catching something, and I found out later, I guess it was mosquitoes, but they're way up high. And I'm, I'd never seen one before, so I'm taking these pictures and, and shooting with the telephoto way up high. And, and after a time, my neck is, oh my God. So, now the brainstorm, Duga. I rush home, I got a chaise lounge. I went back, I put this chaise lounge just outside the sidewalk at the shoe pond, laid down in a poison ivy patch. And I'm up there and I'm shooting and shooting and shooting and people are going by and they're calling my wife and saying, Marie, I think I just saw Doogie laying in a poison ivy patch in a chaise lounge and he's in the shade. He's not trying to get sun. What the hell is he doing? And I was, uh, she told me one of these days, you know, they're going to give you, they're going to swap that camouflage for an, a jacket with a lot of straps on the back. Couple of cedar wax wings uh, having a little encounter. The males fighting over the females, coming in for a landing. You can see the different colors in the tails when they're open, another way of identifying when they were in flight. And here they are in, in one of our trees, just outside the window again. These are just outside my windows. And they come in by the, after I shot these birds high in the tree and took all these pictures, a flock of them showed up just outside my window one day and cleaned these uh, trees of uh, these blueberries on it. That's the female. All she has is the orange on her tail here for, for color. And if any of you have ever eaten at Farnham's in, in, in Essex, wonderful place for clams and so forth, when we go to Farnham's to eat, we go in by boat with the Zodiac. It's a great place. I can, I can zoom right up and uh, pull right up at the, uh, behind the rocks there, walk in, get our food, eat it in the boat, and then go back out again. And in the, within the last two years, they have put up this uh, nesting area here for ospreys. ospreys. Thank you. Uh, for ospreys. And as we were coming out, uh, the male was flying around showing this fish off to the female. He'd take it back to the nest, let her look at it a little bit, then he'd take off again and he'd circle around. So he's right above us here and I, I managed to get some uh, decent shots of him flying around with this uh, whatever type of fish it is, I don't know. Another uh, favorite of mine, uh, the red-tailed hawk. Uh, I could shoot these guys all day long also. Uh, I happened to come across this guy one day just after he ate. And one thing about a red-tailed hawk is when they're eating, they don't care about you. You can almost walk right up to them. They're going to finish that meal and you don't want to think about taking it away. Beautiful bird. And here he is with a clean kill of squirrel. He just, uh, and this was just outside my uh, car door window. And uh, he was like from here to, to that wall away from me. And he just didn't care. He's eating that squirrel until he's, his belly was full and then they'll go. Uh, this red tail I came across one day was eating a snake. He caught this snake right here. But, where he caught the snake, he is in this grackle's territory. This grackle is watching him and he's not happy with the hawk being in his territory. So these are very brazen birds. They'll go after a cat, they'll go after an animal. They don't care if you're in my territory. A lot of times you'll see a small bird in the sky chasing 
a larger bird, a lot of times it's the grackle. And they'll attack in anything that comes into their territory. So while the red tail is trying to have his lunch, this grackle is coming in and really bugging him. Here he is here. And he's trying to finish up this snake, and bingo, here comes the grackle again. And again, trying to wrap this snake up, and bang, right in his kisser again. Finally, he could kind of ticked off and started screeching and swallowed what he had to do, and he was uh, gone. But look at the talons on these guys. It's just amazing. You wouldn't want him to grab you like that. Now look at the, uh, this is the talon of a, a red-tailed hawk, the talons of a red-tailed hawk. And this is something I didn't know until just last year. Uh, this is a snowy owl. And the snowy owl only has three talons, one in the back and the, and the two in the front. But you could see where they could also pierce an animal very easily and kill it with these talons and, and their beaks. Uh, this picture, uh, this is not a live animal. This was a stuffed bird that I just wanted to show the uh, talons because I had never gotten a picture of a snowy owl until two weeks ago. And here's the snowy I got down in uh, Ames, Amesburg. Pardon? No, uh, uh, Newbury, no. Amesbury? Salisbury, Salisbury, thank you. Down on the reserve there. And everybody, yeah, everybody was lined up on the side of the road. And, ah, my first snowy owl. And so I get out there and I'm taking pictures. Uh, this is just wonderful. And bird watches everywhere lined up. And uh, we're all watching it, and my phone rang. <laughs> Not a good thing. The bird got up and took off and went further out, and everybody just turned around and gave me one of these. I'm sorry. So they're still, they stayed, and they're still taking pictures of it. And I just glanced over in the parking lot, and I said, wow, look at over there. An empty parking lot. Nobody's using it. There's a snowy owl on top of a pole. I looked at all these people, and I said, I'll see you guys later. And I went over and found this guy sitting on the top of a pole. I got right underneath him. He was wonderful. So it was my first snowy owl shots. And again, you can see the talons, you know. And that is a live picture. And here he is after he took off. Back on another telephone pole, I took another hundred pictures, and then I, I left. And then the people started spotting it, and all of a sudden there's a flock of people under the telephone pole doing the same thing. I bumped into this guy one day in the woods, and didn't care. He didn't care. He was only as high as the exit sign there, and uh, he just sat there. And I noticed, well, he, he closed his eyes to snooze, because they hunt at night. They have feathers on their eyelids. I, I never knew that. You know, it's kind of cool. And there's my wife, Marie. And look at how close she is to him. And he, she's just looking at him, doesn't mind. Another one of my favorite water birds. These guys come down from the Arctic every year. And you're going to see a mess of them now. They're on the salt water now. But they'll be coming to the, uh, you can go down uh, behind Starbucks and see them, uh, or uh, right where I shot those other pictures of egrets at the end of McKay Street. And the red breasted merganza, a real character, he reminds me of Daffy Duck. He has that look, you know. And uh, just a fun bird to watch. Here he is, just kind of relaxing, you get a better idea of the, uh, uh, the coloring and so forth. He just came up. This guy just broke the surface and he has a small conga eel in his mouth. And he tosses it around and so forth. And with these little narrow beaks, I was wondering how they can hold a slippery eel like that until I read about them a little more and I found out that their beaks are serrated. And when they grab a, a thing, the, the, the serrated teeth, uh, or, yeah, it's like a chicken's teeth, uh, 
you, uh, they can grab it w uh, with these bills and, and hold it until they get a chance to swallow it. Now, here, I, I was very surprised to see this because their bill is so narrow. He went down and he got a flounder. And uh, he's flipping it around here and there. There was a whole sequence. I shrunk it. But uh, he's trying to flip this fish around so he can get it down. And I figured he would flip it head first so that the fins folded when they went down. But he was doing it the opposite. He was eating it tail first. And I noticed he starts taking off. You can see the speed in the water here. And I said to myself, uh, you know, he's, he, I guess he's pushing himself so that he can get this fish down. But it wasn't the case. And he's going a little further. Now he looks like he's got a 35 horse on the back of him, you know? <laughs> and uh, I'm saying, yeah, he's trying to force that fish down by going faster. But it wasn't. The seagull wanted a piece of the action. And the seagull's swooping in. Look at him now. Now he's got a 50 horse. <laughs> and he's taking off like crazy now. And that seagull wants that fish. And Finally, you can see his head swelling, and he got that fish in his mouth, was able to swallow it. And then finally, he kind of, this is kind of like a hand signal that we give people every now and then in traffic. <laughs> he was giving the same thing to uh, the seagull, you know what I mean? <laughs> Up yours, you know? Again, here is, uh, they, they kept that, this, this area had to have a lot of these small uh, eels that had just hatched or something because for two, three days, there was all kinds of birds, loons, everything, diving for these eels. And then a day or so later, gone. There was nothing there. So there must have been a, a cluster of eels at the bottom that uh, these birds were attacking and eating. Uh, you can see how they have to use both feet here to to get themselves going to, to get airborne. But once they're airborne, the red-breasted merganser is the, one of the fastest, if not the fastest, uh, duck uh, uh, when he's in the air. This is a uh, hooded merganser. Uh, you'll see these guys at the shoe pond shortly also. And down the end of McKay Street. Another beautiful bird. This is the female. And this is the buffalo head. And they just look like a black and white bird when you see them from a distance. But when you get close, you get a chance to see their eyes and, and, and the green and the purple and the black and the white and so forth, you know. It's, a, it's just a pretty little, pretty little bird. That's the female. And there they are in the flock. And as I'm trying to get near them, naturally they're going away. But I'm going to get them coming the other way very shortly. And here's why I'd have to freeze, you know. I'd see them on the shoe pond like this, and I'd wait for them one, two, three. They're all down. This is where I make my move now, you know. <laughs> right? And then you can see the bubbles, and you can tell where they're going to come up. So then when they get to here, the bubbles get a little more intense, and that's where I freeze. And they can get a little picky too. Here's two males fighting over a female. And again, uh, a buffalo head taken off. And you can see that they have to gallop before they get in the air. They just don't take off straight up. I caught them just right here with the sun at their back. And you can see the sun coming through their uh, orange uh, web feet. And loons are around now. Loons were never around here. They were always up in Maine. And now they're, uh, uh, and they're out on the salt water, which surprised me. I always thought they were fresh water. But I got this guy out of the fresh water just off of the Quincy Park breakwater. This is the male. And here's two females. Another beautiful bird. And these guys can dive. When they dive, you have no clue where they're coming up. They'll, they'll dive here, 
and come up twice the length of the room. Uh, they can stay down for a good amount of time. And they eat all kinds of things, lobsters, fish, anything they can get on the bottom, they eat. And I spotted him a good distance away. I ran down the dock and I got next to a pole and I just happened to pick the right spot. He, he went down in the water about to the back of the room there and when he popped up he was from here to the birdhouses away from me. I got it perfect and uh, she was right in front of me here. And there she is eating a, a small lobster. And again, popped up right in front of me. Beautiful red eyes. You can still see the water coming off her back. And even a seagull, right? Look at the look at the colors here. I mean, you see these every day, you know. And this is out on the island where I saw the uh, the American oyster catches, and uh, I was taking pictures of them. And seagulls can be kind of a pain in the neck, also, and make a mess, and it makes people very unhappy. So they got the brilliant idea. You know what we can do? We can put out a coyote. So they do. <laughs> now my friend Paul D'Angelo and I were out one day and we were up behind Crane's Beach, I'm sorry, Plum Island, and we were hunting for oysters. First time I ever saw oysters in a long, in, in forever. I, we, we get into some oysters which are wonderful. And I looked over and I saw this seagull standing there and he wasn't moving, he wasn't flinching, he wasn't taking a step, he wasn't flying, nothing, he was just sitting there. And I said to Paul, I said, look at this seagull, he's not moving, you know, he's like a mannequin. And then I'm looking around, I said, someone's setting us up, you know, somebody put this thing here, it's a, it's a fake. And we got a little closer. And I could see that he had a sea clam, but he still wasn't moving. So we get closer, and we could see that he doesn't have the sea clam, the sea clam has him. <laughs> and sea clams can be not dangerous, but I used to get big sea clams when I was diving like this here, and I'd put them in the refrigerator, and when they open up, if you stick your finger in there, it's like putting your finger in a vice. They close back down again. You can't get your finger out. I got a call from my wife one day, crying, screaming. Scott has his finger caught in a, in a sea clam. I said, what? She says, yeah, he put his finger in the clam. It was in the refrigerator, it was open. He stuck his finger in the clam. She says, I don't know what to do. She says he's crying and I think he's gonna, the clam's gonna break his finger. She says, I'm gonna get a hammer and smash the clam. I don't do that. Don't smash the clam, you'll break the kid's finger. I'll be right home. Ran home, got a knife, cut the clam, took the kid's finger out. So, we were watching this and look at it, he lifted the clam right up. The clam has him by the top beak and the bottom beak was still free. He could move this but he can't drink and he can't eat. Now how long he's had this, I don't know, but you can see the seagull is pretty stressed out here. And so maybe he hasn't eaten or drank in, in a good amount of time. So he's, he's getting to the verge where he's ready for collapse and, and that he does. He collapses and, and you can see he's just stressed out. He, he can't get away. Uh, so I told Paul, I'm going to go over and catch him. You keep, take the camera and keep shooting. So uh, I went over and I grabbed the seagull. And, uh, and here he is here. And look at, you can see he's in dire straits. Look at his feathers and so forth, you know. I finally folded his wing up. And here I am with another bird under my shoulder, you know what I mean? I don't know how this happens to me. But I was, in this picture here, I'm trying to pull the clam loose and I can't get him out. It's, he's really got this seagull and I didn't want to hurt the bird by pulling any harder than I was. So I told Paul, he said, go back to the boat, get my knife out of my pocket. 
and uh, and I'll I'll cut the clam. So he did, and again I'm still trying to get this poor bird out of this clam. And then I got the knife, and once you cut the muscle, naturally it opens up, and I freed the bird. And once I freed the bird, he was so mad at this clam, he started biting the clam. <laughs> and once he bit the clam, he started biting me. And I, I got a chuckle out of it. He's between biting the clam, he, he, he was biting me. And finally, the last thing I said to him before I sent him back with his buddies was, don't bite the hand that freed you. <laughs> and that's my show for today, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You're a great audience. Thank you very much.